And the only thing that I think is going to really change all the hatred, the bitterness, the resentment, the wickedness, the sin, the wretchedness, the selfishness, the self-centeredness is full on love. If we really, if every believer, if everyone who considers themselves to be a follower of Christ was really out in their part of the world walking in love, I would venture to say that most of the world would already be saved. And we absolutely would not have the mess in our society that we have today. And many people today are interested in what the answer is to our dilemma in the world. And from a spiritual standpoint, I believe that the answer to that dilemma is really getting out in society and representing Christ. Not just having a bunch of dead, dry religion, but really having the character of God developed in our life, walking in the fruit of the Spirit, which the Bible says there's no law that can come against the fruit of the Spirit. You see, when we walk in love, it's, it's impossible for people to really find anything wrong with you. They may try for a period of time, but love will melt the hardest, coldest heart. But it has to be real love. So I'm calling this tonight, what is true love? You know, there's magazines, true love, true romance. So I guess if there's true love, then there must be an untrue love. And if there's true romance, there must be an untrue romance. So the kind of love that is no good is the kind we talk about that has no action to it at all. It's just a conversation. It's just a sermon. But when it comes down to really putting it to work in our daily lives, then we back off from that. And you know what? There's a lot of stuff to learn to really be a powerful Christian. I mean, I've got, I mean, I've got, thousands of messages that I've preached and they're all vital and they're all good but you know some days when I just feel like you know man Lord I don't know I don't know if I'm doing it all you know there's this message and that message and this one and that one another one another one I just center back to walk in love if you just walk in love you're going to cover all the rest of them amen love God love your neighbor as you love yourself that just keeps it simple for me. So for the last good number of years in my life, I have tried to focus more than anything else in my personal life on loving people and everybody that I get around in my personal life, because believe it or not, I don't live in the little box. I do have a personal life. They let me out of the TV screen occasionally. <laughs> people are amazed when they see me somewhere. It's like I'm not supposed to be anywhere but in that box. But I do have a personal life life. And in my personal life, I try to make it my business to add value to everybody that I come across. And I'll tell you the truth, in the natural, I'm not a real outgoing, friendly person. <laughs> I mean, I'd much rather stand in front of a crowd of a million people than try to get to know one person. I'm not afraid of people, but I'm just I'm just, you know, that's just the way I am. I'm not like a sanguine, real friendly. I mean, we go out to eat, and I mean, Dave is talking to the waitress about where do you go to school, and what are you taking in school, and where'd you come from, what are you going to do with your life, and I'm like, Dave, can we order the food, eat it, and get out of here? And he's like, well, I just want to be friendly. And I'm telling you what, the, the, Mike, the pastor that was up here, he can get on an elevator, and by the time he gets off, have a friend. So I'm just letting you know that it doesn't have to be your natural gift. That's not, you know, I would probably, my natural bent would be to go out in society, go shop and do my stuff, just not say much to anybody, just do what I wanted to do, get the job done, get it over with and go back home. But I have learned that I can affect people's lives just by being friendly. So I've learned to do that. And I'm trying to let you know that even though something may not be a real natural gift for you, if it's something that God leads us to do, we can learn to do it. Amen? Amen?
Amen. Amen. Now, all you, all you people that were born friendly, you're just like all over this. <laughs> and some of you deeper people are like, well, I don't know if I really want to get involved or not. I'm not asking you to get involved. Say hello. How are you? How's your day? That color looks good on you. Your hair looks nice. You know, just simple little things. It's amazing how just a simple little adding value to someone's life can make a big difference. Let me read you a story that I pulled off the web, and this just gives you a good example of what, what love is and how little things can just make an, an unbelievable difference in people's lives. This is by a man named Kent Nurburn, just to give credit where credit is due. 20 years ago, I drove a cab for a living. One time I arrived in the middle of the night to pick, uh, at a building to pick someone up that was dark except for one single light on the ground floor window. Under these circumstances, many driver would just sit outside and honk once or twice, wait a minute, and then drive away if nobody came out. But I had seen too many impoverished people who depended on taxis as our only means of transportation. So unless a situation really smelled of danger, I would always go to the door. The passenger might be someone who needed my assistance, I reasoned to myself, so I walked to the door and knocked. Just a minute, I heard from a frail elderly voice. I could hear something being dragged across the floor, and after a long pause, the door opened, and I saw a woman in her 80s standing before me, wearing a print dress and a little pillbox hat with a veil pinned on it. She looked like something out of a 1940s movie, and by her side was a small nylon suitcase. Well, the apartment actually looked as if no one had lived in it for years. The furniture was all covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the walls, no knickknacks or utensils. Everything was in a cardboard box piled over in the corner. She said to me, would you mind to carry my bag out to the car? So I took the suitcase to the cab. Then I returned to assist the woman. She took my arm and we walked slowly toward the curb. And she kept thanking me over and over for my kindness. It's nothing, I told her. I just try to treat my passengers the way I would want my mother to be treated. Oh, you're such a good boy, she said. When we got in the cab, she gave me an address and then said, would you mind to drive through downtown? Well, I don't mind, I said. I'm not in a big hurry, but, uh, but it is not the shortest way, indicating to her it was going to cost her more money if she went the long way. And she said, oh, I don't mind. I'm on my way to a hospice. I looked in the rearview mirror, and her eyes <clears throat> had tears in them. You see, I don't have any family left, and the doctor says I don't have very long to live. I quietly reached over and shut off the meter. That was the first act of love, wasn't it? This is not somebody I need to make money off of. This is somebody I need to help. What route would you like me to take, I asked. For the next two hours, we drove around the city. She showed me the building where she had once worked as an elevator operator. We drove through the neighborhood where she and her husband had lived when they were newlyweds. She had me pull up in front of a furniture warehouse that had once been a ballroom where she had gone dancing as a girl. Sometimes she'd ask me to slow down in front of a particular building or a corner and would just sit there and stare at the building and say absolutely nothing. The sun was coming up and she suddenly said, well, I'm tired, we better go now. I drove in silence to the address she had given me. It was a low building that looked like a small convalescent home. They must have been expecting her because two men came out ready to help her get into the building with a wheelchair. How much do I owe you, she asked and reached into her purse. I said, nothing. She said, well, no, you have to make a living. And he said, there are other passengers that I can make a living off of. Almost without thinking, I bent over and gave her a hug and she held onto me so tightly she said, you gave an old woman a little moment of joy. Thank you. I squeezed her hand, walked into the dim morning light. I didn't go back to work that day. I just drove aimlessly around, lost in thought for the rest of the day. What if that woman had gotten an angry driver or one who was impatient to end his shift? What if I'd refused to take the run or had only honked once and then driven away? And this is the part I love. On a quick review... I don't think that I've ever done anything more important in my life than that one single act. We're conditioned to think that our lives revolve around great moments, 
But great moments often catch us unaware, beautifully wrapped in what others might consider a small one. Let me tell you something. What I'm talking to you about tonight, yeah. Amen. What I'm talking to all of us about tonight, and you know, if there's anybody in the room who thinks you don't need this, you can throw your share back at me because I'd just be happy to preach this to myself. I need this. Every time I teach on love, every time I restudy on love, it builds me up and reminds me that this really is one of the most important things that we can possibly do in our lives. And it's not always in big things. Many times it is in small little things like smiling at somebody or saying hello or telling somebody, you know, I've noticed that you've been here for several years. I bet you really work hard. You know, one day I was in a, in a bathroom and I noticed a lady in there emptying the trash and I'd seen her a few times. And so I took some money out of my purse and gave it to her. And I just said, you know, I'm sure that you really work hard and a lot of times you don't really get, you know, the, the appreciation that you need. I shoved the money in her hand and just took off. A little bit later, she came chasing me into the shoe department telling me how much it meant to her and how it was just so amazing. And you know what? People are hurting in the world. And they're hurting a lot worse than you think you are. There's always somebody, no matter how bad we're hurting or no matter how bad we've got it, there's always somebody that's got it worse than we do and somebody that's hurting worse than we do. And just for the sake of God, we need to get out in the world and act like Jesus. How would Jesus treat these people as he came into contact with them? You know, we, we always talk about following in Jesus' steps. Well, sometimes we need to study his stops because Jesus always stopped for hurting people. It wasn't just, yes, he was going somewhere and he had a goal, but when somebody really needed help, he was always there to help him. And you know, a lot of that is lacking in our society today. And nobody's going to bring it back if the Christians don't. So we need to stop just yelling about our Christianity and get out there and live it <clears throat> so people can see that we've got something that's worth having. <clears throat> The Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, that we are to pursue this love. Pursue it, go after it with all of your might. That's been one of the things that has helped me in studying the love walk probably more than anything else is to realize it's something that I have to do on purpose. It's not something I can wait to feel like doing. It's not something I wait to want to do. It's something that I do. Don't just pray for God to bless you. Pray that God will make you a blessing everywhere that you go. And it's fine to pray that God will bless you. Every day I say, God, I ask you to bless me and I ask you to make me a blessing everywhere that I go. Don't let me go out in the world, God, and act like I don't have ears and eyes. Help me to hear what people say. Help me to see their needs and help me to meet those needs. We don't even really need to pray for God to meet somebody's need if we could do it and just don't want to. Uh-oh, I better say that again. <laughs> we don't even really need to pray for God to meet somebody else's need if we could do it and just don't want to. Well, you know, you can't do everything. That's right. You cannot do everything, but you better not do nothing. There's a difference in thinking we have to do everything and doing nothing. I can't do everything for everybody, but I refuse to do nothing for anybody. Amen? Indifference makes an excuse, but love always finds a way. We all have our own little excuse bag. We carry it with us. I mean, it's invisible. You know, you don't see it like you do this one. But we've all got one handy and boy, when somebody wants us to do something that we don't want to do, we reach right in there and we just, let's see, we just, we, let's see. Well, that's going to be too hard. <laughs> or how about, um, uh, well, I don't know anybody else who does this. <laughs> well, all the more reason to do it. Or how about, I've never done this before. And I love this one. I have too many personal problems of my own. <laughs> I got too many personal problems of my own to get involved with you. Yeah, well, here comes a word from God. You'll keep them too. 
You'll keep those problems and get a bunch more with it if you don't start doing something to help somebody else. The only way we can be set free is by helping other people. I, I, if you knew how serious I am, I'm telling you, I don't care what kind of a problem you got. If you will get your mind off of your problem and off of yourself and off of trying to solve your problem, here's what God wants you to hear. You take care of his business and he'll take care of yours. Do you hear me? You take care of God's business and God will take care of yours. Psalm 37, 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. I love that. It's not just trust God. While you're trusting God, be a blessing to somebody else. No matter how bad you're hurting, don't shrink back into a corner and just nurse your wounds. I mean, more than ever, keep your word. Keep your commitments. Be a blessing to people. Keep your commitments in giving. Don't withdraw when you're hurting. Come on full force and say, I know that this is an attack of the devil, and I know how to defeat the devil. You overcome evil with good. You don't overcome evil by withdrawing from evil. You overcome evil by doing good. We need to learn how to live to love. Put on love, the Bible says. Put it on. What does that mean? Well, many years ago, I used to have a recurring dream, and I didn't know what in the world it was all about. And I would dream this, like, fairly often. And, you know, when you dream something over and over, you start to wonder, well, is there more to this than what I'm seeing? And, and the dream that I had was I would get to my conferences like this, and my clothes weren't there, and I would, I would eventually have to come out and preach in my pajamas. <laughs> And I would be really embarrassed because I wasn't dressed properly. And I didn't really get it at the time. And then I saw this scripture in Revelations that says to stay awake and put your clothes on. And I thought, what? Stay awake and put your clothes on. And then there's other scriptures that say to put off the old man and put on the new man and put on bowels of mercy and put on your shoes of peace and put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so I began to think, and, and then in Colossians 3, it says, clothe yourselves with mercy, clothe yourselves with kindness. And above all that you put on, put on love. And then I finally got the interpretation of my dream. God said, you're not dressed properly because you're not walking in love. And so when I would come to the pulpit, I had a good message, but because I didn't have a red hot, on-fire love walk in my everyday life, although, yes, I had a good message and that word was blessing people, there was not the power behind it that needed to be there to change lives because the only way you're going to get that kind of power and anointing is if you do what Jesus tells you to do, and that is walk in love. I wish that you would even begin to get a glimmer of how your life would change how your power would increase if you would just give your life to walking in love. Live to love, L to L. Very simple. From now on, I'm going to L to L. That's my new slogan for life. I'm an L to L junkie. I'm an L to L fanatic. I've joined the L to L club. I live to love. I don't live to eat. I don't live to shop. I don't live for Friday. I don't live for vacation. I live to love. And you know, about third day into this, you're going to get tired of it and say, well, you know, just giving this and doing that and nobody does anything for me. No. Remember the God kind of love is to do, is to love people when you're not going to get anything back. And then you know what? You will always get a reward. Sacrifice always brings a reward, but that reward comes from God. The worst mistake we can make is to be good to somebody and to get mad at them because they're not being good to us back. Trust God to be good to you.
Yes, God wants us to be blessed. Yes, he wants to heal us. Yes, he wants to deliver us. Yes, he wants to promote us at work. Yes, he wants to give us the desires of our heart. But the best thing that we can do is stay busy with God's business and let God take care of our business. Okay, I love, love, love this scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all, so that all those who live might no longer live to and for themselves, but to and for him who died and was raised again for their sake. What is that saying? Christ died so we don't have to live a selfish, self-centered life where there's nobody in it but just us. He died so we could be set free from that prison of selfish, self-centeredness. So many wonderful scriptures. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We call it the golden rule. Any one of us could immediately change our lives by just deciding, you know what? God, help me every day to treat other people the way that I would like to be treated. It's, very, it's simple. A kid can do that. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give in to your bosom. Galatians 6, verse 10 says, Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith. What does that mean? Sit on purpose in the morning, take a little bit of time, and think, who can I be a blessing to today? Who am I going to be with today? What do I have that I could give them? What could I say to them that would encourage them? Well, I need a blessing myself. Well, you know what? God will make sure that you get one if you take care of being a blessing to other people. If you don't have a proper self-image, it's going to be very difficult to serve people. And you know, Jesus washed feet as an example that we should be willing to do whatever needs to be done for people. And we see the word servant is an ugly word today. We're going to actually talk about this more this weekend. Jesus called himself the servant. And we need to be willing to serve other people in little ways, in big ways. Hopefully and prayerfully, that's what I'm doing for you here this weekend. I'm here to serve you the word of God and to help you. But now I expect you to take this and go do the same thing for somebody else. That's the way that we win the world. It's not by just sitting and have somebody do it for us, but by taking the help that God gives us and then being willing to give that to somebody else. You know, Jesus washed feet, but he couldn't have done that if he wouldn't have known who he was. And so let me just say this. If we have a healthy self-image... We're free from selfishness and we're free to love. We no longer need to worry about what people think about us or what they're saying about us. Our worth and value is not tied up in what our job title is. So it doesn't matter to us if we're washing windows or the president of a company as long as we believe with all of our heart that we're doing what God wants us to do to the best of our ability. It doesn't matter what the world thinks of your position. The only thing that matters is, are you doing what you believe that God wants you to do? And if you are, then it doesn't matter what the world thinks about it. Amen? Amen. Well, what does a healthy self-image look like? This is the way you should think. I know God created me, and I know he loves me unconditionally. I know I have faults and weaknesses, and yes, I want to change. But I believe that God is working in my life, and I believe he's changing me day by day. While he's doing it, I can still enjoy myself and enjoy my life, and I can still be a blessing to other people. Although I do have faults, I also have strengths. I'm going to maximize my strengths instead of focusing on my weaknesses. I like myself. I don't like everything I do, and I want to change, but I like myself. I like what God has created. I don't want to ruin the life that Jesus died to give me by rejecting myself. My worth and value is not based on how other people 
have treated me or what they think about me or what they say about me. It is based on the fact that God created me and Jesus died to redeem me and he loves me and therefore I can love myself and therefore I am able to love other people. Amen? Amen, 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 amen. Well, the most important thing that we can do in the whole world and something that puts a big smile on God's face is to learn how to really walk in real love. And you know, real love is not just talking, but it's action. We need to learn to step out in love and affect other people's lives with the love of God. That's the greatest billboard that we could ever carry around for Jesus is to love people. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 3, that even when you are in times of having trouble yourself, the thing to do is trust God and do good. Trust God and put a smile on somebody else's face and your breakthrough will come. You know, Mom just had a vision years ago to um, really just, she just thought about people, you know, hurting and not being able to get, you know, care for that. And so she, we just basically started looking around, how can we start helping people? And so we started with hospitals and, you know, we just go, um, you know, five, six times a year to different countries and um, just try to help as many people as we can, try to go to the poorest, most unreached places that we can find, places that really do not have access to medical care and um, just help people. Door ontzendingswerk Hand of Hope ervaren we hoe levens veranderen en harten open gaan. Uw bijdrage, groot of klein, maakt veel uit in het leven van een mens. Hij krijgt daardoor een warme maaltijd, medische verzorging of hoort voor het eerst over Jezus. Help mee om Gods liefde aan zoveel mogelijk mensen door te geven. De zon gaat op en de wereld is mooi. Maar dan ineens stormopkomst. Laat je niet door je gevoelens leiden. Joyce Meyer laat je zien hoe het anders kan. In haar boek Emoties in Balans. Bestel het boek Emoties in Balans nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22-100. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.